the week, another day where we're going to be answering some of the garden questions to make your gardening journey the best of the day. I'm trying to rhyme. I'm a poet. I don't even know it. If you wonder who the heck I am, what the heck am I doing here? Why am I and why are you watching me? Uh, who am I really? I, I'm Frank Ferragini, aka Frankie Flowers, four-time best-selling garden author, uh, as well garden expert. I'll call myself that because I have over 10,000 hours of gardening experience. Yeah, way more than that. Uh, I'm here each and every week to help you on your garden journey, to answer some questions, to inspire you. But at the same time, the people on this community, we have a beautiful community of people that are all here to really help you along and really help you answer some of those garden questions. So if you have questions, put them in the comments. If they're in those comments, what'll happen, even if I don't know the answers to those questions or I can't even get to those questions, then people in the community will help you along with your journey. Uh, busy, busy time, busy, busy time. And with that, we got a couple of big shout outs this morning. We're just going to give quick ones out there to Windsor this morning. That's to Michelle. We also have another good morning this morning out there to Maria. Good morning to you as well. Crystal is saying good morning as well. Good morning from Curtis, Ontario. So I was mentioning to you at about a busy time later this afternoon at two o'clock. Let me show you where I'm going to be. Uh, it's going to be fun. So you have still a chance to come see me this afternoon. That's in Perry Sound, Ontario. I'll be leaving my home shortly to go up there to Perry Sound. That's the wacky world of gardening. That'll be at the Stocky Center at two o'clock this afternoon. We're going to talk to you about some of the uh, different interesting things that people have done in the garden to really help with their garden. But at the same time, their neighbors might think that they're a little bit strange. So that's where I will be later this afternoon. We have rain on the way. We had a beautiful sunny day yesterday but things are growing and things are green. I can encourage you, if you can, get out there and weed the garden because the weeds are going to get ahead of you. I actually have been so busy, I still need to weed. I'll see if I can slide an hour of that in this afternoon. Uh, well, this morning that is, or maybe even when I return home, but we got the rain on the way. It's always best to weed a garden after it rains because the weeds come up so easy. Now that temperatures are warming, now it is actually a perfect time as well to maybe even think about top dressing and overseeding your lawn if you had any damage. Uh, grass seed will begin to germinate uh, because now we're having warmer soil temperatures. It's also the perfect weekend or perfect day to maybe start with your vegetable garden. In the terms of starting with your vegetable garden, you can direct sow uh, carrots, onions, you can be doing radish, you can be doing spinach, you could be sowing uh, Swiss chard in, you can even be planting some kale, you could be planting some cabbage, any of those cool crops you can be planting. I would really encourage you to maybe wait and hold off on things like tomatoes and peppers from planting those outdoors, as well as squash and beans. Hold off on some of the warmer crops from planting those outdoors. Uh, you can be a dividing, dividing your perennials this weekend. No problem with that, with some rain that we have later this afternoon and some rain set for Monday. Today's a good day to be doing the divisions. After that, if you're in Southern Ontario, we're into a real sunny period. A reminder, sun is stress on plants, even though it helps them grow. But if you're doing divisions, transplanting, it's really key that you're around to be watering uh, those plants after the divisions. Let's go to some uh, comments and or questions this morning. We got a good morning from The Rock this morning from Newfoundland. Good morning to you as well. Uh, great to see you this morning, uh, Francis. Uh, we got a good morning shout out this morning from Woodstock, Ontario. Good morning to you. Uh, we got another shout out this morning question. This is from Paula Mooney. Um, how do I protect little piglet grass in East Willemberry? So the best way to protect some of the grasses, the ornamental grasses in the winter months <clears throat> is number one, by leaving them a little bit taller and actually not even cutting them back. That's really key because that'll actually allow snow load to get around them, snow to collect around them. And that snow is an insulator. If you're having problems with them overwintering year after year after year, then it's probably a better suggestion for you to pick a more hardier variety. There are many different varieties that are out there. In terms of if you just plant it and protecting it during the summer season, deep and frequent waterings is key. Uh, getting root establishments really key. Using a quick start fertilizer is really key. But in order of protecting it, mounting leaves or anything like that really won't help out because it actually can cause more harm than help. Just leaving a little bit of that foliage there is super important. Uh, my good friend Matthew Amos is saying good morning there. Uh, we got uh, a shout out this morning in Thunder Bay. Cloudy here again today in Thunder Bay. We have had a lot of overcast guys, even in the province of Ontario. We're out in the west. They've been seeing forest fires in Alberta. Alberta and even into Vancouver has been seeing lots of sun out there as well. As well. Uh, so 
the the little piglet grass you're looking is there a variety of little piglet grass that is hardy in east Willenberry? so first thing that i'm going to do is i need to remind myself and we're going to look at this together uh little piglet grass because i want to see so this is a fountain grass and this is a penisteum so this is the penisteum so um i know exactly i want to show people what this is so i'm just going to show my screen here as well uh this here I'm just going to go here. Sorry, guys. I just got to share my screen. Uh, so that way I can show you what we're looking at. So this is a beautiful penicetum. And there's actually a red fountain grass. And this is the green version of that same penicetum. Uh, these are an annual grass. And in terms of overwintering them, they are not winter hardy. Is there an annual variety that will give you that same plume? No, there isn't. You can try to overwinter this if you actually had a, um, a sunroom that got cool in the winter but didn't really freeze too solid. You can overwinter this in some containers. Uh, you can do divisions. You can do that as well. It does need a slight dormancy period <clears throat> with some cooler temperatures in the winter, but it can't go below a minus five in the ground because it won't overwinter. So is there an annual variety that will give you a beautiful plume like that? No, there really isn't. That's going to stay that compact and that short and still look great as an ornamental. I wish I could tell you that there are some ornamental varieties of that, but there aren't. Not one that's going to give you that same appearance. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, we got another question here. When should I cut back my plum and cherry trees? I'm in Newfoundland. So generally when you're doing any of the real, so any pruning right now, you could do pruning of any inward growing branches. So even though they probably haven't bloomed yet in Newfoundland, or maybe they have, um, the inward growing branches, we're always trying to remove some of those smaller branches, the inward growing ones, and you can do that pretty much at any time. But the ideal time to be pruning fruit trees like that is in dormancy. So when in dormancy is when they're in the winter months. So anytime that they drop their foliage and they're in full dormancy, that's the time when you should be doing pruning on most fruit trees. And remember, when you're pruning a fruit tree, the key is, is we're doing selective pruning to shape the tree. The second thing that we're doing is we're actually removing inward growing branches so that we can open up the inside <clears throat> so that we get better light that goes in. And then also it's going to get better air, air circulation. And with that air circulation, it's going to reduce the amount of diseases that you have as well. Um, here we go. How many times do you mulch or remove old mulch? You don't necessarily ever have to remove old mulch because the mulch should be breaking down and adding back into your soil. You may be wanting to top the mulch. And a lot of the times you can be doing that almost annually where you're topping the mulch. Uh, the mulch itself is usually um, one that will need additives even every two to three years because it does break down. So you can be adding to it annually if you want to top dress and freshen it up, just a few bags just to kind of add to it. And then that way the cost won't be as great. But every year it's breaking down. It's actually breaking down, decomposing. That's why you're like, where did the mulch go? If it's a cedar mulch, you're seeing it break down. Um, we have a question and or comment this morning, even just a hello, Claudine, this morning. Good morning from Ottawa and the nation's capital to you. Um, Marlene, uh, Marlene Gregory. Good morning, Frankie. Thanks for the answer. Had a feeling it was a pine tree or a grapevine roots. Do I need to do anything uh, to my dirt due to the activity, acidity of the pine? So this is a really good question. So Marlene sent me some pictures because sometimes there's nothing better than a picture that will allow me to assist you with what an issue is happening or maybe suggestion. So Frankie at frankieflowers.com. Take a look at my website. You can even see where you can submit an email there. It's frankieflowers.com. She sent me a picture of these roots that she didn't know what they were. And what I discovered by taking a wide shot. So she took a tight shot of the roots and I asked her then for a wide shot of the area. I could see that there was a mature pine in behind. And the roots were most likely the pine that were coming under the fence and spreading into her property. So now with the pine, the pine, when it drops its needle, will acidify the soil. So we either neutralize that acidity or we look for acid-loving plants to plant there. Acid-loving plants, some examples include Northern Lights Azalea, beautiful flowering, spring flowering, um, broadleaf evergreen, but it will still kind of drop its foliage. Rhododendrons are another example of that. So we either plant for the type of soil that we have here or what we do is we adjust and or amend the soil to then allow us to plant. If you just want grass, then you have to neutralize the acidity. The way that we diminish or neutralize or almost, um, so where we, we neutralize that pH level is we add a horticultural lime. 
and that horticultural line can be a bot and purchase at any independent garden centers or any places that sell garden products. And so you're looking at a horticultural lime to neutralize the acidity if you want to grow lawn underneath there. Uh, can you suggest something to get rid of dandelions? Uh, so dandelions, which is uh, Dent de Lyon, that's the uh, French name. And if you're wondering what it means, Dent de Lyon, dandelion means lion's teeth. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the upside of dandelions if you have a few. Uh, the upside of a dandelion is a fully edible. Actually, the roots, the leaves, and the flowers are fully edible. I wrote a book called Power Plants, and there's many different benefits to dandelions. Uh, they're full of iron. Dandelions, their flower in spring, is an early bloom and or flower source for many pollinators that are out there. So those are the upsides, maybe if you want to keep dandelions. Now, if you want to rid yourself of dandelions, you have a couple different options. Number one, and these are due to the cosmetic pesticide ban. So we don't have any broadleaf, selective broadleaf herbicides that we can use outside of something that is Health Canada approved. And what is Health Canada approved is Weed Be Gone. Weed Be Gone is a spot treatment where you can go through your lawn and you can then spray some of the dandelions you have in your lawn. And it's got a chelated iron. So what happens is when you spray the dandelion, you will actually see the dandelion. You have to do this when it's fairly dry and or sunny out. When you spray the dandelion, you'll actually see it almost rot, blackens and rots. And then around the grass, it gets actually a deeper green. And sometimes you may need to do a few applications, but Weed Be Gone is one solution. The other solution to control dandelions is hand removal. So you can go to your lawn and even some of the more mature, more established perennial weed with a taproot that we have to remove that weed. The, the key and the real um, key to success is that when you're removing a dandelion, you have to remove the taproot itself. So everything. So there are some dandelion diggers, but if you don't get the taproot and we snap the taproot off, that dandelion will regrow. So hand removal or we be gone. Those are the two ways to control or rid yourself of dandelions. Another couple of things too, is just in terms of your lawn is allowing your lawn to get a little bit taller. So where you're cutting your lawn at about three inches, that is our number three on your lawnmower, depending upon what it measures at three to three and a half. That's going to actually shade out any weed seeds below that will not allow them to germinate. If you are putting down soil and you're looking to thicken up your lawn, then you want to cut your lawn a little bit shorter so those grass seeds can get there. Um, the other thing that you're hearing right now, and I want to just kind of continue on the discussions about lawn, is the no mow may. So the no mow may is something that became popular in the UK and now is gaining some traction in other areas. The philosophy, I'll tell you the reason behind no mow may, is that it is going to allow for some of the beneficial insects and pollinators that are either in your lawn or using some of those early flower source that they'll actually get those flowers and that they will uh, benefit from some of the things like dandelions blooming. The, and I'm just going to tell you why I say you should be mowing in May, especially if your lawn is getting over that height where you're starting to see the blades fall over, you need to mow. And the reason why you need to mow is if it starts to fall, fall over, we're going to encourage disease. We're going to encourage insects. If it's that tall, next time when you go to mow your lawn, you can actually be impeding some of the insects. And the other issue that we have here in North America, uh, particularly in Canada, is ticks. So we all know that ticks will always live in taller grasses. So that if we want to eliminate or reduce the chance of ticks and causing problems to our pets and or ourselves, then we have to mow in May. So... I'm a pro of mow in May, and that's for good garden, health, good lawn health that's going to be out there as well. So, but I just wanted to kind of give you the reason why you're hearing it and the reason why I'm somebody that's saying here in North America, we need to mow in May. Um, and good mort for Sturgeon Falls. And good morning. That's a good mort from Sturgeon Falls. Oh, good morning to you too. Uh, we got a shout out this morning from Ancaster as well. Uh, and that's from Jane. Good morning, uh, Jane. Carol is asking, can I plant herbs? So the herbs that you can plant right now is I would feel totally comfortable with you planting parsley right now. I'd feel totally comfortable with you planting mint. Plant mint in a pot. Don't plant it in the garden because it can spread. I'd be totally comfortable with you planting chives right now. I'd be totally comfortable with you planting oregano right now. I'd be totally comfortable with you planting rosemary right now. The one thing that I would not plant yet because it's still a little bit too cool is basil. Basil or basil is a warm crop that hates cold temperatures and hates a cold wind. 
Uh, so I would just, that's the only one that I would wait till it's a little bit warmer outdoors. Uh, here we go with a question this morning from Elaine. This is the first year I'm planting overwintered canna lilies. Amazing. I pop them into their pots. That's getting full morning sun. How long does it take for them to grow back? So when you're overwintering a canna lily, it's the tuber that you're overwintering. The tuber is essentially the root system. When you've overwintered that root system, as long as that root system didn't rot and we're still seeing that it's actually got life, it didn't actually rot and or dry out. Sometimes you can see where they actually dry out and you see there's no plumpness to them. Then you'll put them into a potting soil in a pot with good drainage. And then you'll start to see them actually start to sprout within a couple of weeks. You should be seeing some growth. If you're not seeing growth within a couple of weeks and they're indoors in a warm location, if they're outdoors and they're cool, they'll sit fairly dormant. But if they're indoors and they're a warm location in a sunny spot, <clears throat> within a couple of weeks, you should be seeing growth. If you're not seeing growth, then there's a problem with the tuber and or the root that's there. We got a good morning from Sturgeon Falls. Good morning to you this morning. Uh, good morning from Whitby as well. We got a good morning there from Guelph. Good morning to you. And that is from Judy. Uh, we got another good morning. And I love these good mornings from Rosie out there this morning. And then we have another little good morning in, uh, comment from Susan. Good morning, Frank. Looking forward to seeing you this afternoon. Myself as well. I want to hear about all your garden adventures. I saw that you actually entered a horticultural uh, event the other day, uh, one of the hort societies, and I think that was in MacTier that you entered. What is the positive and negative cu cutting back ornamental grasses in fall or spring? So cutting them back uh, in the fall, the benefit is, is time. Sometimes, so where you are, which is up in Muskoka, is sometimes it depends on the variety of ornamental grass. If that old micro grass will start to bend over due to heavy wet snow and mat down, that can actually cause some issue and meaning that it will cause issue in terms of the matting down can cause rot and actually cause some harm. The benefit of leaving them up is sometimes you can enjoy that animation. You can enjoy the plumes that are there and as well, it will allow snow to collect around them for insulation. But in Muskoka, you don't need to worry about that snow as an insulator because generally we have a pretty good snow load up there. So in Muskoka, my recommend, my, what I would recommend is probably to cut them back in the fall versus the spring. Um, and then really, if it's time, if you don't get to them in the fall, you can still cut them back in the spring. But because of the snow load, because of the risk of them actually falling over, matting down due to heavy snow load, in Muskoka, I would be more of a recommendation of cutting them back in the fall. Whereas if you're more down towards Oakville, Toronto, where sometimes we don't have snow loads, I would leave them up a little bit so that snow could collect around them and actually provide a little bit more insulation that's there. Uh, we got a thank you this morning from Paula out there as well. Uh, Mary Ann, we have a good morning out there as well from Nobleton. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I just need to give another couple shout outs. Let's just take a look here as well. So I already mentioned about the event coming up at the uh, Stocky Center. I want to also remind people that coming up uh, next weekend, uh, Saturday, is the plant sale at the Richmond Hill Gardens uh, Horticultural Society, where they have some uh, availability for the Garden Sunshine Rose. They're available uh, and you can pick them up, but you need to purchase them ahead of time. You can see the pricing there for members are $30 each to the public $35 each in a little bit of uh, the information there, you can see that they're uh, a part of Brad's uh, Gelbert's Select Roses in honor of the Society's 100th anniversary in 2014. So a great way to uh, raise some funds out there as well as to enjoy a beautiful rose variety. If you're looking for some good rose varieties um, that were actually developed here in Ontario, the, the 49th parallel series of roses by Vineland Research Stations, there are many different varieties and colors. You'll see them available at many of your local garden centers, as well as some of the stores out there. I recently popped by my um, superstore and I saw some in the superstore that were there. So those are some really hardy rose varieties that are available out there as well. Um, we're just going to see what we got here. Uh, here's another comment and or question this morning from Joy. Good morning from Mulmer. Does pea moss really help loosen the dirt? Um, so if you have a full clay-based soil, no, not at all. What peat moss does is peat moss doesn't really loosen the dirt. What peat moss does, I see a beautiful sparrow that I'm looking just outside my window right now. I wish you could see it just kind of hanging out. It's beautiful. As soon as you see some birds, you're like, oh, look, a bird. Um, 
What peat moss does is the purpose of it is it lightens the soil. So if we're using it in a soil mix and we're mixing with garden soil uh, or just a compost, it's lightening the soil that actually almost makes it more of a container focused soil. It has the ability to lighten soil and then has the ability to absorb moisture. And it's almost like that sponge. If it's a clay based soil uh, and you just add peat moss to clay, it's just going to mat in with the clay and really not do much. Sometimes what clay needs is even a little bit of sand to be added in there, sand and peat moss. But generally, if you have a clay-based soil, what I would recommend for you is to either dig the clay out or to build a raised bed. I would probably be more inclined for you to build a raised bed on top of the clay. Uh, so if you have a hard, compact soil, adding a bunch of peat moss to it is not going to do a bunch. If you have a hard, poor soil, what I would be more recommending you do is to improve that soil by adding organic matter. And organic matter is a composted soil. So sometimes your municipal compost, you can get it, or a triple mix is a good example of something like that as well. So hope I answered your question there. Um, got a question about ants, I think. <clears throat> good morning from Sudbury. The raw, uh, Sudbury is the big nickel. Uh, I found three ant hills, okay, so far in my backyard. How do I get rid of them in a way that is pet friendly? So probably the most easiest pet friendly way to get rid of an ant hill is uh, they don't like water. <laughs> So you can drown them out. So just putting a slow trickle of water on top of them you can drown them out. The other thing that you can do is you can boil some water and you can pour that over the ant mound. You can create some baits and the baits, <clears throat> you want to protect them though with your pets, but I can give you a suggestion of a bait that's not going to harm a pet more so it'll harm the ant. The bait is 50% uh, sugar and 50% borax. You just put a little bit of that near some of those ant mounds the worker ants will come and grab the borax and sugar mixture and bring it back in and feed the queen. The borax will actually um, control slash kill the queen. And once you do that, the colony will be done. So once again, you can either drown them, you can either boil them <laughs> with hot water, or you can use the ant bait situation that's there as well. So there you go. Um, we got a good morning this morning as well from Overcast St. Thomas, sometimes an Overcast day. It's not a bad day. I'm going to go back and tell you about some other events that are coming up because it's busy, man. I tell you guys, it's busy. Uh, so coming up on, so I have a busy Saturday that's coming up on uh, Saturday, May 27th at 10 to 10.30 in the morning. I will be in Oakville at Duran Place for Kids. And then approximately around the noon hour, you can come meet me up at uh, Bradford Greenhouse Garden Gallery in Barrie. That's my our family, forgive me, our fa family's uh, berry store location. Uh, I'll be up at the berry store on that same day, the 27th, uh, where we'll be uh, helping you uh, at the berry store, talking a little bit about communities in bloom. But in the morning, I'm going to go support this plant sale. Kind of double book myself, but I'm going to try to do my best at that. Now, the other event that I'll show you, which is the next day, which is going to be in uh, Niagara-on-the-Lake. I told you, I'm busy. I'm a glutton for punishment that's out there. The next day on the 28th, Sunday, the Monday, uh, Sunday, the May the 28th, I'll be at a garden party at Two Sisters Winery at Niagara on the Lake. That's from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, we're going to be talking on that day all about flavor, about growing flavor uh, around your property and how to incorporate that into some beautiful meals. Uh, also, when to harvest herbs, uh, best time to enjoy those herbs. And then what are some great wine pairings? So we'll be doing that as well. So there's a little bit about the events that are coming up there as well. So let's go back and uh, answer a question. I have a problem with voles. So vole is uh, very similar to a mole and similar to a mice. They often um, are field mice, so to speak, and they will eat the roots and they're eating, but this one here says eating plants. They tunnel through the dirt and lost all my lilies and clematis last year and they're back this year. What do I do? <clears throat> so if they're eating roots, then the one thing that we can do if they're tunneling is we can actually, you'll, you'll even see what are called whirl jigs So we can actually put something that's going to be on a steel pole that will catch the wind and will vibrate. So sometimes you'll even see people bury uh, wine bottles in the ground. When the wind blows across them, it'll vibrate and that'll irritate the voles. Uh, blood meal, putting blood meal down. If they're eating the top foliage of the clematis or some of those other plants, you can be spraying with animal, uh, animal be gone. Animal be gone leaves a, a taste on them. And then the others that you can trap the moles, the voles, forgive me, that are there. So those are three different options that you can do for vole control. So once again, 
uh, you're vibrating the soil, something that will vibrate the soil. Next, it's trapping or discourage them from eating those plants by spraying them with something that's going to repel them, distract them, and that's animal be gone. So those are three different solutions that you have for there. And the other thing that you can distract them is by putting blood meal down on the soil. Blood meal will actually fertilize your plants. So blood meal is a good thing for plants. But a reminder as well is that if you were to put bone meal down, you can attract a lot of different things because bone meal is made from bone. So it's blood meal is necessary there. <clears throat> Need a tall grass for privacy. So this is Elizabeth Elizabeth. So internal ornamental grasses, there are several different varieties that are out there. Um, there is actually a zebra grass that's really quite nice. It's uh, fairly easy to grow. Uh, it does get to about four to five feet in height, but really what I need to know is where are you? Where do you live? What's your hardiness zone? And hopefully it faces south because ornamental grasses will always do best with a southern exposure because they generally like sunshine that are out there. Um, that's the same question that we have there. And then let's go over here for another question. We're busy today. Good morning. I love the daffodil color, color hoodie. Yeah, and you know, right in my backyard, I'm looking at daffodils right now. I have a bunch of King Alfred daffodils that are planted and they are great. Okay, hey, the other thing that I'm thinking about. So I love tulips, right? And then last year we did that river cruise uh, that was adjusted because of some of the water levels. But I'm thinking what we should be doing is a river cruise, a garden oriented river cruise in the spring. So that way we can take in some of those spring flowering bulbs in the Netherlands and go see Kuchenhof and things like that. If you're interested, send me an email, frankie at frankieflowers.com, frankie at frankieflowers.com. That way I can show all the different people out there that, yeah, we can do it. Ashley, still got to call you, Ashley. Oops, hit send too quickly. Is it safe to trim the cedar hedges this week? Thank you. Yeah, you can do some basic maintenance pruning on them uh, up there in Aurelia because I know Ashley's in Aurelia. Uh, looking at the overnight temperatures, we are totally fine and you are safe to go that's out there uh maria good morning maria how are you how are you when should i plant the vegetable seedlings which i have planted earlier in uh covered seed trays some of them have already come out should they take the lid off or keep it on till the plant come out so as soon as when you're germinating seeds as soon as we start to see the emergence of leaves we're taking the lid off and that's when we're allowing them to see more light so the only reason why we have those those plastic trays over top where you're saran wrapping is to increase the humidity and allow that humidity to sit within them to help with the germination of the seed. As soon as we start to see at least three leaves, that's when we want to remove those covers off because if we leave them too hot, too humid in there, then we'll actually have the, we'll increase the chance of downy um, of um, where the rot is basically what we'll see there as well. Um, here's a great thing too. I want to show this. So that in this community, if I don't get to answering some of the questions and you're seeing some of the questions and you know the answers, get on there and answer. Like Suzanne is helping here and helping with uh, Brittany and, and telling her, I mulch every spring at the end of May. Once all the plants are up and they're actively growing, I lay about one, two, two inches over old mulch. And that's a really a good habit because that mulch is always breaking down. So I can see that different people out there, please add your suggestions. Because once again, this is a community where we're helping everybody out there. Good morning, Frankie. I have new tree seedlings coming Wednesday. Butternut and smooth arrow uh, wood. Any suggestions on how to transplant and put them in the ground? Thank you. So they're a seedling. All we're doing is when we're going to be putting them in the ground is we want to make sure that they're not competing with, if we were just to shove them in the ground and there's grass right near them, then the grass is going to compete with them. So we want to remove that grass. So generally when we're planting anything, we're going to dig an area, no matter what the size of the root is there, we're going to dig something about twice to three times in width, and then about one and a half times in depth, putting in good soil that's there. And if we can use a transplant fertilizer, like miracle Grow's Quick Start Fertilizer, then that's going to reduce the amount of transplant chalk. And the key is, is after we planted them, is adequate watering. So where you're going and you're soaking them at least three times a week if it's a sunny week, uh, and we're not allowing them to go dry, if they need protection, if they're just a tree whip, like a little seedling, then sometimes what we'll do is around them is we'll even put a little bit of chicken wire around them. And that chicken wire around them would prevent maybe somebody that's going to cut the lawn or a whippersnipper or even animals from going ahead and eating them. So those are a couple of things that you can help them and improve their success. Here we go. Good morning as well. Uh, Jean, 
We live near Port Elgin, beautiful area, near the beach. Jealous, sandy soil probably. The house is surrounded by bush on three sides and the soil is sandy and poor. So I didn't even have to read it. As soon as you said this to me, I knew you had sandy so soil. Our lawn care person has tried many things in different grasses, but the lawn never gets great and the moss comes back every time. So the reason why you're getting moss is not necessarily, uh, so it's compaction. So this is interesting because you say you have sandy soil. So the areas where the moss is coming back, it should actually have more clay that's there and compaction because moss will not do well in sand. So generally what moss needs in order to grow is it needs an acidic soil. So generally it needs clay because clay is acidic. It needs a compacted soil, clay is compacted. It needs shade and it needs moisture. So if what we're doing is we actually neutralize acidity, so aerating, make sure that we aerate is really key, that reduces compaction. Putting down a horticultural line neutralizes the acidity. Pruning some of the trees around will then allow more pockets of light to get in. And then putting uh, um, some of the um, grass seed down. So what, this seems really interesting to me, me, Gene. So what I would love you to do is take a picture, a wide shot of the lawn, a couple shots of the close up of the lawn, and please email them to me, frankie at frankieflowers.com, frankie at frankieflowers.com. And we'll figure out what lawn seed would probably be best for you. Is lawn the best thing for you to do in that area? And maybe are we doing a mixed kind of grass seed in that area? Something like we're mixing lawn seed and clover to help you out as well. So let's see what, if we can figure that out. So there we go. Um, we have another lawn question perhaps. My grass is thick and a bit spongy in the backyard. Should I still fertilize it? My grass is thick and a bit spongy in the backyard. Should I still fertilize it? So the reason why we're fertilizing a lawn in spring is we're actually trying to make that lawn the thickest, healthiest thing. And we're actually trying to improve its health so that we're actually allowing it to have really good root systems and really good energy as it's going into summer season. Because summer season, when the temperature gets high, hot, and we have extended periods of sunny conditions with not a lot of moisture, the lawn is tough enough to get through. So if you haven't fertilized, I would recommend fertilizing. Being spongy, I'd like to know a little bit more about spongy. If it's spongy, that means that maybe it's just wet underfoot. If it's spongy and wet underfoot, I would wait for the lawn to dry slightly before applying a fertilizer. Because if it's spongy underfoot, then you're going to be causing compaction on that soil, which could be doing a little bit more harm. So I'll answer, I hope that helps you too. I'm going to answer one more question and then we're at half an hour. Uh, Bobby, how can I keep big ants and little ants off my plum tree? Can it be done without chemicals? So the reason why generally you have ants on a plum tree is it's not the ants are there and causing problems to your plum tree. The ants are there because they're eating the secretion of either the plum tree is um, leaking. So sometimes you'll see that happening, uh, which can be even uh, uh, showing black knot, or you have aphids on your plum tree. Because the aphids, when they're there and they're actually eating away at some of the flower buds or even some of the stems or uh, the tender shoots of the uh, plum, they're secreting a honeydew and then the ants are there eating that honeydew. So if we get rid of the aphids, we get rid of the ants. Quickest thing that you can always do is just take a high pressure wash and wash them off. Boom, you get that. But really the key to control the aphids is by either attracting ladybugs into the area, that'll take care of aphids, or we can use an insecticidal soap. An insecticidal soap is not a chemical. So an insecticidal soap is Health Canada improved. It's not harmful to humans. And it's basically made up of dish soap and water. Uh, one that's Health Canada approved is Bug Be Gone. It's an insecticidal soap, totally safe to use, safe to use on ornamentals and edibles as well. So that's what you can do to control. The other part too is that if you're looking to control different, there's different baits that you can use, bait stations, uh, that we can do, but it'd be really interesting when you have the ants, if the ants come back on your plum, take a picture of it and send it in to me because I'll share it as well. So we're just over 30 minutes today, guys. I know there's lots more questions out there and I really, really hope that if you know the answers to those questions, get on there and answer. I'm here each and every week. I think I may do another one midweek this week, uh, possibly on Wednesday, Wednesday evening, because it seems that everybody's got lots of questions. So I'm gonna hop on one more time and help you guys out. I'm here to help you with the garden season. Check out my website, frankieflowers.com. Go to the bottom of the website. You can sign up for a newsletter that comes out every month. Uh, I'm gonna be heading up to Perry Sound shortly. So you guys have a great day. And for those that'll see up in Perry Sound later this afternoon at two, look forward to seeing you. Let's have some fun today. Take care.